Perfect. Thank you so much, or I'll start by saying danke to uh, Marie-Louise and Nelly for the invitation and, and the introduction, and of course, uh, guten Morgen to all of you. And I'll now apologize and say that's about all the German that you're getting out of me today. Um, you know, I could, I could probably say my German is not very good. I think the truth would say that it's, it's non-existent, really. Um, so thank you for, you know, being open to listening to me talk to you in English. Um, to give this presentation at such an interesting conference about techno fixes and you know their impact on the climate crisis and, and how we're going to address these things. So I have a bunch of things that I want to explore with you in this presentation this morning. Um, I want to start by giving a bit of context on the climate crisis itself to show why this is such an important issue and then we'll dig into why these techno fixes are uh, you know something that we need to be paying attention to as we seek to address this very serious crisis that you know uh, affects us all basically right and so I want to start with this quote from the UN Secretary General, which I thought was very, uh, you know, very topical for what we're talking about today. And I feel like his language has been getting more extreme, more dire uh, as the years have continued to pass. And so he said last year in November 2022, we are in the fight of our lives and we are losing. Greenhouse gas emissions keep growing, global temperatures keep rising, and our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. You know, I think we can all recognize that this is the situation that we're in right now. We face this really dire moment, and this was said at the uh, climate conference in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt, last year, which, you know, I don't know if you had the chance to attend, but I was there for a few days, and I would say it was not very hopeful uh, and inspiring for the path that we are on in the future and actually being able to address this crisis. And as the Secretary General says, you know, as we see, Emissions do keep rising every year. This is a graph of annual CO2 emissions globally. You know, we've recognized that this is a crisis since, you know, the 1950s, the 1960s. That's really when we started to talk about this. There was, there was obviously scientific reports on, you know, the, the warming climate and the effects that carbon dioxide would have earlier than that. Um, but we can see that as we started to recognize that this crisis was serious, you know, emissions just kept spiking. And, you know, that's not to say that some countries shouldn't develop and shouldn't try to improve their living standards, but unfortunately they followed the model that we pursued. Um, and that has meant a lot of emissions that uh, now we need to try to really reduce, right? And we see that they continue to rise. The only kind of the only kind of reduction, I guess, on that little chart is that very unique year we had in 2020 as much of the kind of global economy slowed down. We can see that was a very small reduction in the actual uh, kind of global CO2 uh, in that moment. And so obviously, you know, this climate crisis is causing a lot of problems, a lot of worsening natural disasters around the world. I just chose a few various photos here. Um, you know, the first one in the top left is a, a massive hurricane that we had in Canada recently that affected my province of Newfoundland and Labrador. You know, most people haven't heard of it. Maybe you have because the German chancellor was there last year uh, to make an agreement on a hydrogen deal. Um, but, you know, other than that, maybe you haven't heard of it. Um, you know, obviously the wildfires in Spain last year as Europe was undergoing you know, the, the heat wave that I think you all know about and probably lived through. Um, you know, the bottom left, of course, is Pakistan, where flooding affected millions of people last year, obviously a part of the world that is really feeling the impacts of climate change. Um, and, you know, they experienced wet bulb temperatures last year. And, you know, the kind of natural disasters that this part of the world keeps experiencing just keeps getting worse. And, of course, the last picture is the drought that occurred in China last year. And I don't know about you, but in the North American media, there was a lot of reporting on heat waves in Europe and North America last year, we didn't hear so much about what was going on in China, even as they were experiencing a massive heat wave as well. So we see that these crises are something that we're dealing with all around the world. They just keep getting worse. You know, we recognize that climate change is not something that is just, you know, happening into the future, but is here right now, and that is affecting all of us. And so you might say, Paris, didn't you just show us this graph? I, I promise you it's a different one. Um, this one is atmospheric CO2. So you know we're basically around 420 parts per million that's in the atmosphere, you know, far above pre-industrial levels. But what I really want to point out about this graph is that it shows you know, how that has continued to, as, to increase as we have been going through this process of you know, kind of trying to come to some international agreement about addressing the fact that we are contributing all of this CO2 into the atmosphere, that we are warming the climate. And we can see that as these conferences have been held, as these agreements have been reached between various countries internationally, 
you know, the, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere just keeps rising and rising and rising. We haven't really stalled that as the graph on, you know, the increasing total annual CO2 has showed us. And so what does that kind of make us recognize about this whole process? And I would say that, you know, at its core, we need to recognize that this was a really about creating a market solution to the climate crisis, right? We might think, and the way that we often talk about it, is that this kind of international UN process was around addressing this cri crisis, trying to reduce emissions, but really it's about trying to put together a framework so that we can address this crisis through the lens of the market, right? It's not how are we going to do this most effectively, most efficiently, but how can we make it work in a market system, given that you know, we live in this economy um, where, you know, this is how things work, right? Everything needs to go through the market. There needs to be profits generated through this. And the reason that this is the approach that's taken, of course, is because it provides opportunities for profit and growth. We recognize that companies need to trade, that we need to set up markets. Um, if we're going to have this economy continue to grow, we need to promote new companies. And so this is what, especially the most powerful, most wealthy, most influential countries in the world wanted to see happen. And of course, that means that the government's role is one where it just provides incentives and frameworks, right, for how we're going to address this problem. The idea is they shouldn't be stepping and kind of intervening directly into these markets to try to address these problems head on, but to think about how we're going to create a market that's actually going to work and spur private players to take the actions that they need to take in order to address this thing, right? And so we've had this process now of several decades of trying to sort out this market system and it still doesn't seem to be delivering the results that we expect. And so, you know, some of the key tools here are carbon markets and offsets. Um, and those are pushed in particular by the United States during the Kyoto Protocol, um, you know, negotiations in 1997, which is what the photo in the background there is of. You know, at the time, uh, the European Union is kind of pushing the idea of a carbon tax or a carbon price in that way, but there's not agreement among all of the uh, EU member states. I, th I believe Spain in particular is offside with that, so there's not a common agreement on that approach. And so the US administration under Clinton and Vice President Al Gore pushed the idea of you know, cap and trade, emissions trading schemes, carbon markets, and that becomes kind of the central part of how we try to address this problem. Um, and of course, we see the United States doesn't move forward with that because in the early 2000s, they elect a Republican president, George W. Bush, I'm sure you're familiar with him, and he has no interest in addressing the climate crisis, and instead it's Europe that kind of moves forward. And in 2016, the EU releases a report on offsets in particular, showing that 85% of the offset projects they look at have a low likelihood of delivering real emissions reductions. And of course, there have been many kind of studies, investigations by climate groups, by media organizations over the years that find that these, you know, offset projects aren't really delivering the results that we expect, but they ensure that industrial emitters, large emitters, you know, people who emit a lot don't actually need, need to reduce their emissions at the stores and can use this as as an opportunity to show that, you know, they are actually addressing the problem, you know, don't worry too much about this, but actually, again, emissions keep rising and they're using these, uh, this kind of false uh, way to show that they're reducing emissions in order to move forward. And so what we see is that climate technology is a way of supporting this goal, right? The techno fixes that we're talking about today are a way of trying to create another way for the market to address this problem. You know, if, if carbon markets and carbon pricing aren't getting us the full way, how do we get even further? Well, of course, we look at technology as the route to get there, and we'll discuss that further in a second. So the search for this kind of market solution continues, right? Um, we're still trying to find it, even as we see that, you know, the natural disasters are getting worse, the amount that we're emitting keeps going up, you know, but we're still looking for this uh, elusive market solution. So when we think about techno fixes, you know, what are these? How should we understand them? And I would say that there are a number of ways of looking at it, but I think as we kind of dig under the surface, it shows us more about what's going on here. So we can look very kind of, you know, ba at a very basic level and say that techno fixes use engineering or technology to solve a problem, right? You know, if, if we're not kind of getting in deep, if we're not kind of really looking at the wider effects of these techno fixes, we can say, okay, we see a problem, we're applying technology to it, that's how we should address this thing, right? But obviously, if we start to scratch below the surface and we start to ask some critical questions, we see that that's not really how this necessarily plays out in practice. So techno fixes also redefine a problem as technological instead of political, right? We recognize that the climate crisis is inherently a political problem. It's the result of political decisions that have been made 
over you know, centuries, basically, but especially in recent decades as emissions have continued to soar. And instead of saying, okay, what are the political decisions that resulted in this? Why were these decisions made and why are we not undoing them? Instead, you know, looking at techno fixes as the way that we address this problem is a way of saying, okay, let's not look at the politics here, but we need to recognize that the technologies are the problem and we just need better technologies that will address this, right? So let's stop thinking politically, let's stop thinking about who benefits, who doesn't, how you know, we distribute benefits in our society. Instead, let's just think about the technologies that are here. And as a result, techno fixes distract from existing low tech solutions, right? The reality is that we have the technology that we need to address the climate crisis if we were really to have the political will to institute it and to use it, but we don't. So instead we ignore those solutions that already exist right now that we could use with existing technologies. Um, and instead we say, no, we need these new technologies that are just coming down the line that will really address this crisis. If we just give it a few more years, you know, they'll all arrive and everything will be perfect. Um, and of course that, provides a justification, those techno fixes then provide a justification for continuing the status quo, right? Let's not kind of rock the boat, let's not think about the problems that exist in our society right now, the problems that are creating and causing climate change, but also that cause a lot of other issues. Let's not think about those things because everything right now is working, we just need new technologies and then that will fix the problem and we can continue going as, as we have been right now, right? Let's not challenge the system, let's not challenge the privileges and the power of the people who are in power right now and who are creating this problem, let's just continue on this track and get our new technologies to fix this. And of course, as a result, then those techno fixes can encourage inaction, right? If we think that the tech solutions are just around the corner, are just going to arrive in a few years, why would we take the difficult actions today to address this problem when we know that we won't have to do that if we just wait a little while, right? And we constantly see that, that waiting continue, right? That delay continue. That's part of the reason that we're in this problem or, or that we're in this uh, position that we're in now where again, emissions keep rising, the natural disasters keep getting worse and we haven't actually addressed the problem. So if we look at someone like, you know, Bill Gates, of course, uh, you know, very influential, you know, media loves to talk to him, whether it's COVID policy, climate policy, whatever, uh, they'll turn to Bill Gates because he has a lot of money uh, to deploy, you know, a lot of profits that he made from, you know, uh, kind of enclosing part of the tech industry and being able to profit from it. And so in his 2011 book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, you see him talk about what the approach to addressing climate change should be. And he says, in general, the government's role is to invest in research and development when the private sector won't, because it can't see how it will make a profit. Once it becomes clear how a company can make money, the private sector takes over, right? So this is the kind of approach or the framing of the problem that people like Bill Gates and influential people in the tech industry are putting out there. You know, don't have the government get too involved in this. They can exist at the scale where they are setting up the investment for the technologies and, you know, creating the market frameworks for the private sector to get involved in this problem, to address this problem. But beyond that, you leave the decisions to the private sector, right? The government takes the risk, the public sector takes the risk, and then privatizes the reward, the gains, the decision making. So you leave all that to the private sector, they get to decide who benefits from this, they get to decide how the technologies are deployed and rolled out. Um, you know, and ultimately you still have people like Bill Gates who make the profit from all of that because he's investing in those solutions. And so I want to come back to talking more about the technology in just a second, but I want to switch to talking about a specific example of this, right? Obviously we recognize that electrification is something that's going to be very important to addressing, you know, the climate crisis, right? To reducing our reliance on fossil fuels, but how we actually roll out you know, electrification, how we actually approach this topic is going to make a very big difference to the ultimate impact that it has. And so I think before we get into like, you know, the, the broader question, I think a little bit of historical example is, is interesting here. Um, this is of course the, the image in the top left is the GM EV1. So this was an electric car that was launched in the late nineties when California was making a big push to, you know, start to go electric, right? To move cars toward electricity instead of fossil fuels. Because again, there was a recognition that we needed to address the climate crisis, right? Um, and of course, as I already said, what happens also around that time, you know, you have the Clinton administration administration in power federally, they are, you know, Al Gore, of course, is very pro, you know, doing something on climate change, at least, you know, he, he has a bit more of a neoliberal position, but still they want to address it. But then, of course, George W. Bush comes to power, 
And all that needs to stop because he's on the side of the auto companies, he's on the side of the oil companies. And so what you see here is George W. Bush with a hydrogen vehicle um, that he calls the freedom car. And an energy economist at the time said that the freedom car is really about Bush's freedom to do nothing about cars today, <laughs> to make sure that nothing actually changes. People keep relying on fossil fuels. And of course, that's what happened, right? They did, defeated the mandate in California. So you know, there was no requirement that electric cars start to roll out, and this transition to electricity, this transition to electrification gets delayed, right? And it, it also kind of creates a void, right? If the government is not gonna lead us in this direction, if the traditional automakers are not gonna lead us in this direction, who is? I think you all know this guy. Um, <laughs> this is, of course, Elon Musk. You know, he's sitting in one of the early Tesla Roadsters here looking like a very excited little child, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, he kind of enters Tesla in the mid-2000s. He's just sold his stake in PayPal, which was one of the companies that he was involved in early on, and invests that into an electric car company. You know, he doesn't actually start Tesla, even though he says so later for a number of years until he's sued to make him stop saying that. Um, but, yeah, so he buys his way in, you know, and because of that, you know, obviously there's a recognition that we need to address the climate crisis, that electric cars are going to be part of the way that we do that. And so, you know, there's a whole kind of media narrative, media framing made around Elon Musk because he is kind of positioned as the man leading us into this future, right? He is building the electric cars. He is addressing the climate crisis. He is saving the world, right? And for a long time, that was like the narrative that we got about this man. I think it's changing for much of the public now, hopefully. Um, but, you know, that was how it was framed. And, and I would just say, maybe as an aside, that I think I think anyone could have kind of stepped into this role, right? It wasn't just because Elon Musk existed at this particular moment that uh, we have electric cars now, but if it wasn't Elon Musk, I think we just had a, would have had someone else who would have been framed as this person, right? Um, and so if we look at the vision that Elon Musk has for electrification, I think this is very important, right? Because it, it reflects you know, the visions of Bill Gates, but also I would say of many of our governments and how they are pursuing the idea of how electrification is going to work. And so this slide here is from the Master Plan 3 uh, presentation that Elon Musk gave earlier this year, where he is kind of laying out the grand vision for Tesla beyond kind of the short-term shareholder goals. What is the way that this company wants to transform the world? And you can see here his plan to eliminate fossil fuels is basically by electrification, right? Electrifying the energy grid, switching to electric cars, switching to heat bumps, and some other changes. But what is kind of core to his vision is that we electrify these parts of society, but we don't change anything else, right? We don't think about any of the other w systems that we've built up, any of the ways that we've constructed society, kind of the inequities that exist, the power um, you know, inequities, the power dynamics, the fact that he is, you know, has $200 billion somewhere around that. Is that fair? Is that right? Um, is that kind of the future society that we're trying to live in? Um, and you'll see here, uh, at the end of this graphic, sustainable fuel for boats and planes. Um, you know, in his vision, he's also still flying his private jet. That That is not a problem. You know, it'll just be slightly more sustainable this time, I guess. But I think in the photos that I'm showing here is basically like, you know, the idea that he has is that, especially in North America where he is located, you know, it's it's what his kind of whole vision is oriented around is that everyone will still drive their cars, they'll just be electric now, everyone will still live in their suburban homes, their big, big mansions, they'll just have some solar panels on the roofs. You know, nothing will really change about how society is set up. We shouldn't question, you know, the legacy of these, again, political decisions that have been made for many centuries, decades. Instead, we just change the way that we power these things, and that's how we address it, right? And it's an inherently kind of conservative vision for what this future could be, right? Let's, let's not think broadly, let's not think deeply about the society that we've created and what has put us in this position in the first place, let's just change how we power it and then leave everything else. And he says this quite distinctly uh, in this presentation he gave, he said, there is a clear path to a sustainable energy earth. It doesn't require destroying natural habitats. It doesn't require us to be austere and stop using electricity and be in the cold or anything. Uh, there is a clear path to a fully sustainable earth with abundance. You know, 
this, this idea about like people being cold is the idea that we might like reconsider how things are working, right? Does it make sense for everyone to own an automobile and to live out, live in like a spread out suburban community or should we start thinking about how we've built these communities and what it actually means to live a good life? You know, don't think about any of that. And he also says, you know, as we pursue this transition, as we ensure that everyone's driving their electric cars, you know, it, it isn't destroying natural habitats. Don't think about the potential environmental impacts that might come of this. The current system is bad. The new system is good. Let's leave it there and let's just say, uh, you know, continue on this road that I, Elon Musk, am charting for you uh, and that Tesla is hopefully going to benefit from. But as we know that, you know, there, there are a lot of trade-offs that come with these decisions, right? If we're looking at kind of the, the vision of this future that is being laid out by people like Elon Musk where we keep society the same and we just electrify everything, there's a very significant amount of mining that's going to be required for that. You know, some people, some critics would say that we're even swapping one extractivism based largely on fossil fuels for another based largely on mining, right? Um, you know, the International Energy Agency estimates that we're going to need a 4,200% increase in the amount of lithium that we might need for this kind of future scenario and other significant increases in other minerals and metals. Um, and that has very significant impacts on the world, right? And if we think about like the automotive system, a lot of this will be necessary for car batteries in particular. You know, if we think about smaller vehicles, if we think about getting people out of cars, that makes a very significant difference for the amount of minerals that we might actually need. Uh, David Kirsch, a historian, says that there is no such thing as an environmentally friendly automotive technology. You know, we frame the problem as the internal combustion engine. Maybe the problem much more deeply is the automotive system that we've kind of been you know, made to rely on over many centuries because that's most profitable to get everyone to buy cars and things like that. Um, and we know that that mining has very serious problems around the world, right? Uh, you know, there's a photo from the Democratic Republic of the Congo where a lot of the cobalt and copper is being mined, um, where we know that there's child labor involved in that, where we know that, you know, there's a lot of health impacts, a lot of community impacts. In Chile, there's a very significant boom in lithium that is ongoing. Um, what's happening there is a lot of, you know, this takes place in the um, Atacama salt flats, so there's not a lot of water there. So it uses up the water, decreases the water table, and so then people, you know, can't access this fresh water. Um, so, you know, it's a very significant issue for these communities. In Indonesia, there's a big boom happening for nickel, again, to go into electric vehicle batteries. Um, you know, you can see the, the water here maybe in this photo is orange because of all the pollution that is going out. Of course, that also have, has impacts on the people who live there and the communities that are there. So again, very significant impacts, right? Electrification is essential, but it isn't enough on its own. And I think that this is really kind of the key message, right? Um, that these visions are designed to distract us from political questions. So instead of thinking, you know, who is going to benefit in this future, we just say, okay, we're going to electrify, we're going to move to this future, this is going to address the problem, let's not think about anything else. We're not thinking about, you know, how Elon Musk is designing this future so that he continues to have the privileges that he has, so that he helps that Tesla will benefit and profit from you know, the movement in this direction by selling a lot more electric cars in particular, but also how, you know, auto companies are kind of incentivized to want us to buy more cars. That's profitable for them. Mining companies really want us to extract more minerals around the world. That's going to be great for their business models. You know, there's a lot of governments that are pushing us in that direction because it's going to create jobs in their kind of economies and things like that. Uh, in Canada, the United States, we certainly see it. I'm sure in Germany as well with the big auto market here. Um, and so, you know, it just requires us to think about, you know, what role technology serves and how we're actually going to address this problem. Because what we know is that technology is inherently political, right? It's often treated as though this is something that is outside of politics, right? That we can use it in any way that we want. We just need to, you know, think about how we're deploying these technologies. But actually, technology itself and how it's developed, there's a lot of political questions around that that shape the way that it moves. And so I would say that there's kind of like a traditional model of tech development that we're often shown where it kind of proceeds in a linear fashion, right? And this is very kind of, you know, I'm simplifying here, of course. Um, but, you know, people might say, you know, we start with fire way, way back in the early days, you know, when we're first kind of figuring out, we're first kind of, uh, you know, developing as a species. We invent the wheel later, you know, um, electricity you know, I guess 150 or so years ago, or 200, whenever that was. Um, you know, so we're, so we're really progressing here as a species. You know, we invent the computer a few decades ago. Uh, now we have iPhones. This is, this is fantastic, right? And all of these kind of technologies are building on one another. So for one to exist, another has to exist. And 
there couldn't be any other pathway that this kind of mode or this path of development would have proceeded on. This is the way it goes, and the question is just how far and how fast we move on this trajectory. Um, and, you know, of course, this is associated with progress, right? Going back to the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, you know, this idea that as technology progresses, we as a society progress, and let's not think about who actually benefits from these technologies and whether they're actually serving us, you know, in a, in a kind of bigger picture way. And because what we know ultimately is that, you know, as, as I said, technology is political, and the tech industry wants us to depoliticize technology because that's what works for them, right? Then we don't question their business models. We don't question the way that they're deploying technologies in society. We don't question the technologies that they're actually developing. And I would say that we're in a moment right now, you know, and, and for the past few years, I guess, where we've really been kind of questioning um, you know, that model and that kind of narrative that has underpinned the Silicon Valley model and the broader kind of global tech industry that has been inspired by it, um, where we've realized that, you know, by kind of letting these companies off the hook, in particular in the early 2010s, by not seeking to regulate the products and the companies that were really exploding at that time, we're now trying to kind of, you know, make up for that, right? To try to reckon with the problems that came as a result of that. And that happens in many other arenas beyond digital technology. And so we know that techno technological development is shaped by social, political, and economic forces. Um, that ultimately, you know, technology is not something that is completely neutral, not something that just happens on its own, but the types of technologies that we actually pursue are inherently, you know, dependent on the society that we live in, on the politics that are governing that, on the economic systems that incentivize and resource technological development, right? Obviously, we live in a system that is based on profit, that is concerned with earning more profit that is concerned with increasing control over workers and the broader public. And so naturally we have technologies and you know the resources and the investment goes into technologies that further those goals rather than kind of, you know, broader, more egalitarian goals that, that we might actually have about, you know, making society better, about empowering workers and all these other sorts of things, right? And you know, there's certainly plenty of history there that I can't get into in this entire conversation, but you know, we can really see when we look at the history of how these technologies are developed that the people with the resources choose, you know, the paths that technology and technological development ultimately go. And it's, it's a path that serves their position, that serves their power, that enhances it, um, and that ensures that, you know, power, that, uh, you know, even democratic decision making is kind of taken out of our hands. And climate techno fixes are no different um, in that sense, right? As I was talking about, they really, you know, serve to ensure that we don't think about the broader questions and that these technologies are deployed in such a way where they ensure that we don't question these broader forces, these large companies, the, you know, the fact that we're reliant on fossil fuels. You know, we have uh, carbon capture of stori and storage, of course, which is often deployed as one of these techno fixes to ensure that we constantly delay the phase out of fossil fuels because, you know, in just a few years, we'll finally uh, perfect this technology that will ensure we can scrub the emissions and, and make sure that they don't kind of reach the atmosphere. Or it's okay that we don't phase it out quickly because we'll have direct air capture that can just pull it back out of the sky later so we can vastly exceed our goals today and then we'll fix it later, fingers crossed, hopefully. Um, and so I, I think about this quote often by uh, this American science fiction author, Ursula K. Le Guin, and she says, technology is the act of human interface with the material world. But the word is consistently misused to mean only the enormously complex and specialized technologies of the past few decades, supported by massive exploitation, both of natural and human resources. And again, this goes back to, to the point that I made before, right? It's not, you know, we have the technologies that we need. It's not about recognizing the low-tech solutions that we have right now that can reduce emissions very rapidly if we thought about kind of the broader political situation that we find ourselves in, the social dynamics that we find ourselves in, and how we might want to change those to actually address not just the climate crisis, but, you know, the broader crises that are happening in society. But instead, the focus is on these kind of massive scale tech projects that require a lot more resources, a lot more energy in order to deploy, and that might not even uh, arrive by the time that we need them to. And so just some final points, I guess, to end on. You know, climate change, as I've been discussing through this presentation, is a political problem. It's not a technological one, right? It's framed 
in a technological sense because that's what benefits particular actors in society, but ultimately um, this is about politics and the decisions that we make are about how we're going to address this crisis and who ultimately benefits from how we address this crisis are political ones. Um, you know, we have the technology we need, we just lack the political will to use it. Uh, and, you know, these narratives around techno fixes ensure that we don't, uh, you know, ask these difficult political questions, that we don't, you know, take these efforts to actually address this problem. They distract us from real solutions that we already have and that we can use to address this problem. You know, the goal, ultimately, of these techno fixes and of this larger project is to keep capitalism running and to ensure that existing power structures are not challenged. That's the whole goal of these techno fixes and the larger kind of effort that I was talking about earlier to try to find a market solution to this problem, right? To ensure that we don't rock the boat, to ensure that we don't kind of disrupt the power relations that exist right now. Um, but, you know, we allow things to keep chugging along and, and we just invent our technologies that will allow a bunch of companies to make a bunch of new profits by selling them around the world and things like that if they can sort it out eventually, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, and, you know, ultimately, we need to challenge these techno fixes, but also have an attractive alternative, right? It's not to say that technology won't be essential and won't be necessary to addressing this problem, but the question is what technologies we rely on, how we implement them, and who ultimately benefits. And again, those are all political points, not technological ones. And so that's why we need to be focused on the politics and not just the techno fixes and the technology. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Maybe another applause for our pairs for this amazing talk. Um, so uh, we were thinking about, I'll ask some questions first. Uh, what a privilege. And then um, you were, uh, it's your turn. So if you have any questions, don't forget them. Um, you will, uh, you will get your turn. Um, but yeah, I have, uh, I mean, I have a, a lot of thoughts. Um, but what really stuck with me is this uh, tech billionaires have dis discovered climate change. <laughs> is this a good or, a, or bad thing? And in theory, it could be a good thing. Um, but of course, what we see is, unfortunately, that, and you said this very well, that they apply the same tech solutions to this as they do on, on their own core business. Um, again, I can... <laughs> quote Elon Musk's uh, foundation that is now funding planetary tech and Waylex, which is a marine geoengineering technology, so not just carbon capture and storage, um, and, and many other things. Uh, the Gates Foundation has been funding gene editing for years. Uh, we know um, that these charities are problematic because often it's a way not to pay taxes, especially in the US, and then they offset the problematic work uh, of the core businesses, uh, like Amazon's uh, uh, problematic uh, tr treatment of, of its workers and, and the Bezos Earth Fund. We all know about these problems. Um, and you, uh, you mentioned attractive alternatives. I think it's very um, difficult for p many people to understand, and even for journalists to understand, why it's a bad thing that uh, these tech billionaires uh, get engaged in, in climate change. So my question maybe to you is how do we communicate this better, that s sustainable investment is better than putting millions into climate technologies, as these attracted alternatives often mean people and societies have, have to change something, which is very difficult to communicate. Yeah, it, it's a big question, um, and thank you so much, of course. You know, I, I, I think to start on your, you know, your broader point around the tech billionaires discovering climate change, um, like, I, I guess inherently the recognition that climate change is a problem is probably not a bad thing, right? Um, but what we find most recently, or, or, you know, increasingly, is that a lot of these tech billionaires will say, you know, climate change is a problem, but the bigger problem is, uh, you know, demographic issues and, you know, the, you know, there's a lot of other kind of concerns, a lot of other things that they are concerned with that, you know, probably don't matter so much or, or aren't as big of a deal to most people um, in the world, right? So they recognize climate change as is an issue, but it's not always like right up there, uh, which, is, which is a problem because 
Ultimately, because they are so powerful, because they are influential, the way that they deploy their wealth, the things that they say have a lot of influence, again, going back to the media, but also governments and the public who, who listen to these things, right? Um, and so that shapes a lot of the narratives that we have around climate change and how we're ultimately going to address it because someone like Elon Musk or someone like Bill Gates are very influential people. Um, people want to listen to them and you know, they have a particular idea of how we're going to solve this problem. Again, Bill Gates says that, you know, we've already figured out the easy things and he doesn't want to be involved with those. So instead, he's just going to try for the hard stuff, right? And that's all these massive technologies that he wants to invent that he thinks will actually address the problem of climate change and basically, you know, kind of the bigger thing, what he's really saying is that they will allow climate change to be addressed in such a way that doesn't challenge his position in society, right? The fact that he is uh, a tech billionaire, he even says it's okay that he still flies a private jet because he also invests money in climate technologies, right? Um, so these are a lot of the things that I think we need to consider when it comes to these billionaires, but again, your question on how we actually communicate these things, how we think about these alternatives is incredibly important. And I think that one of the issues that we have, again, is where these billionaires are so popular, are so attractive, um, you know, to the public, to the media, get a lot of attention, it becomes a lot more difficult to get a narrative in front of people that doesn't reflect their ideas of how we're going to address this crisis and how we're going to, you know, do something a bit differently. You know, one thing we even see, of course, in, in North America is that when these solutions do get out there, you know, ideas like 15-minute cities or something like that, um, you know, it creates a, a right-wing backlash now um, because, you know, they are also very much paying attention to what this is going to mean in terms of changing these larger kind of political and social and economic structures if we were actually to address this crisis in a way that, you know, is actually going to address not just the core of the climate crisis, but also these other crises that kind of we're facing as a society and challenges people's power and their positions in society. Um, and so I do think it's important to kind of have a vision of what this alternative is going to look like and to make it one that is attractive to people. Um, and ultimately, I think that the way that you get people to pay attention to it is, you know, these billionaires are very organized, they're very influential, they have a lot of power. The only way you're going to challenge that is with kind of, you know, movements, people who are organized in society who can present a counter narrative and because, you know, there's collective organization, they can get some more attention. Um, you know, and obviously we see that growing in many countries around the world, but that's the only way that I see to really kind of challenge that and present an alternative and get people to pay attention, right? Because people as, as individuals um, are not really going to have that ability to go up against kind of uh, Bill Gates or an Elon Musk. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, the power of the collective, uh, but the narrative of the individual, which we uh, currently are living in. Um, in relation to this question, and you kind of mentioned it already, we currently um, see this movement of the tech scene towards a more politically conservative side uh, and conservative ideas, um, bordering or even often crossing the border to right-wing ideology. Um, one prominent example you mentioned in your presentation already is the changes in Twitter and the spread of racist and fascist uh, accounts ever since Elon Musk took over. Um, I mean, scaringly himself often being part of that um, of the problematic narrative or him engaging with right-wing accounts. Um, but it's not just him, it's, it's the funding that goes into the tech sector that has increased from conservative uh, and right-wing figures. Uh, I don't know if you know Peter Thiel, who's, uh, who's one of these uh, investors. Um, but now thinking back to the early internet, um, it was a bit of the, the opposite actually, wasn't it? Uh, more of an, an um, anarchical space with lots of people aware of big corporations, uh, skeptical of the government, but more from a leftif, uh, leftish uh, kind of perspective. Um, but now we see this um, sort of corporatization of the internet. Um, does this mean there has to be this conservative shift or what does it mean for us as users and how do we combat this? Because I mean, now just focusing on the internet, it's, it's kind of the same for every technology, but um, having these big billionaires invest in tech and then also sharing these conservative um, ideas, how, how do we deal with that? Yeah, again, a, a serious issue, right? Um, and I think it's interesting to like look back at the early days of the internet and, and the narratives around it, right? The idea, of course, and, and 
you know, what was very common at the time was kind of in a sense like a bit more of a libertarian framing, right? A libertarian approach to these things and that could take various different forms, various different perspectives, right? A lot of people were trying to escape from, you know, kind of the corporate influence but also the government influence. But I think when you look at the people who were more kind of at the top uh, in that moment who were kind of leading this charge, they were certainly concerned about the government and they wanted the government out of their affairs, they were less concerned with corporations, right? When you look back at, say, um, you know, the early writings of the uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation and, you know, the people who kind of led that, you see that there was a, an interest in, you know, or a, a, a big concern in government reach, government overreach, you know, what it could mean for the internet, there was not as much mention of corporations and what they would ultimately mean. And of course what we see in the United States in the mid-1990s is that the internet is privatized in that moment, so the corporations can move in, the corporations take over, and of course, you know, we fast forward a couple of decades and we get to the point where we are today, where corporations dominate what happens online, they shape everything that happens online, and everything we do has to go through kind of one of these major corporations, right? And I think that the conservative shift that you're talking about is not, you know, some of these people kind of had these conservative ideas and were very open about it early on. Again, you talk about Peter Thiel, right? Again, you know, he's, he's from Germany, uh, maybe you know. I don't know if he still has citizenship, to be honest. I think he gave it up. Um, but, you know, he, from a very kind of early stage, was involved in kind of right-wing organizing at Stanford University, started the Stanford Review, which was like a right-wing student newspaper, um, was saying kind of very racist things, uh, very sexist things, you know, he, he opposes democracy, all these sorts of things, right? He funded um, Donald Trump and he continues to fund kind of right-wing campaigns in the United States. Um, so he, and, and you know, there's some people around him who were always kind of there, who were always kind of open about conservative leanings, but then there was kind of the wider tech industry that had a bit more of like, you know, again, in the United States, they would say liberal. I know that has a bit of a different connotation here. You know, they usually talk more about social liberal. You usually talk, I guess, more about class, class economic liberal, but you know, uh, in the sense that they were, you know, I guess more, more centrist or, or even left-leaning is the idea. Um, but obviously these people gained a lot of wealth um, over the past number of decades, right? They became very wealthy as the tech industry, as the internet kind of blew up, as their companies exploded, and as they reaped the gains of that. Um, and so now they're much more concerned about taxation, about regulation, about, you know, what the government can do that might impinge on their ability to do whatever they want, essentially. Um, and we see that in particular with someone like Elon Musk, who used to be very close to democratic administrations in the United States because they were investing in electric vehicles, they were putting money into space travel. Um, you know, Barack Obama was uh, very influential in privatizing the U.S. space program, in restricting what NASA could do and ensuring that money went to private companies like SpaceX. Um, so there was this very close link, but of course by the end of kind of Obama's uh, tenure, the mood is starting to shift on the tech industry. You know, by the time Trump comes into power, a lot of these uh, billionaires in Silicon Valley are a lot closer to Republicans. And now that the Democrats are back in power, you know, they're very openly supporting Republican candidates and kind of far-right Republican candidates at that as well, um, because they want to ensure that they're not taxed, that their companies are not regulated, that you know they're not kind of held to account for the problems that they've caused and continue to cause uh, in U.S. And, and kind of global society, right? And so I think that is how you can understand this kind of shift mm -hmm. to the right um, among these you know, very wealthy and very influential people. And obviously I think we see this kind of more general kind of rightward shift in a lot of our societies where some far right parties are kind of gaining traction in a lot of countries around the world. Um, but it's certainly not great then to see these very influential, these very powerful and wealthy people going in that direction as well. And not just kind of funding candidates and funding political campaigns because there's a lot more of this that happens than just Peter Thiel. Um, but also, as you say, kind of reshaping you know, important platforms that are key to what we do online to ensure that kind of right-wing viewpoints and, and you know, really far-right viewpoints at that are kind of gaining prominence, right? And we see Elon Musk not only engaging with those types of accounts, but there's a feature on uh, Twitter where you can kind of sus subscribe and give money to individual users, and you can see that he even uh, kind of gives these people money directly and is kind of in direct contact with them. So yeah, it's a really serious concern. And 
in a way, even though we talk a lot about these tech billionaires who are, of course, mostly based in the US, it's a, it's a problem for us worldwide. Um, and I mean, I think that's something we can continue to talk about uh, throughout the whole conference. But I have one um, final question before I hand over to the audience. Um, so I've been thinking a lot about um, how this corporatization of the internet has also led um, to the current discussion we have around AI and the possible replacement of the workforce. Um, now, you have discussed this, um, this interesting theory in your podcast that AI will not replace work uh, as technology has ever, was hardly ever done that in the past, but it will make it more precarious, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, I mean, all of us work in, on computers, I, I suppose, and, and we do uh, see the use of chat GDP also in, in even in our work already. Um, but your theory is, if I summarize it correctly, chat GDP will not replace all content workers, but will lead to um, less lucrative works uh, or jobs where they, for instance, get just paid less to correct what chat GDP texts. Um, I find this theory uh, incredibly interesting um, because uh, most of the discussions we have in Germany, at least, but I think it's, it's a global thing on how do we change our political landscape, is always connected to work. Uh, if we want to change something, let's not lose any jobs. That's the most terrible thing in the world, which, I mean, of course it is, but uh, maybe that's the... Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of a shadow discussion because when it comes to AI, suddenly that seems to be okay. <laughs> um, now, my question is, um, uh, is this sort of an opportunity for us as civil society to connect the, um, the issues many people are working on uh, in, in non-tech related fields, among them workers' rights, with... Uh, the tech discussion, now that we have something that threatens us as white-collar workers once again, but now very visibly, uh, is this an opportunity where we can link different fights, or do you think uh, it, that's a bit of a, too much of a dream, or how can we achieve that maybe, to, to frame it more positively? No, I, I definitely hope so. Um, yeah, I, I think that the AI discussion is fascinating, right? As you say, you know, I, obviously I host the podcast. I'm, I'm quite critical of the tech industry if, if you haven't picked that up already. Um, but I think that, you know, one thing that I have watched over the past number of years is, is how this industry operates, right? And there's a constant need to cycle through technological ideas and technological products, right? So there's always kind of a cycle where there's a new technology that's just emerging and that needs to be kind of hyped up be, to drive investment into it, um, you know, to ensure that a bunch of companies are going to get startup funding, you know, so that they can get started. And the venture capitalists hope that one of these companies is really going to take off and they're going to make a huge profit. And then within a year or two, you know, kind of the hype and the excitement drops down down, the valuations drop down, but some of these some of these venture capitalists have been able to kind of get one of these companies to go public, make some money off of it, and then the cycle begins anew, right? And there's a new technology. You know, you might remember two or three years ago, um, apparently we were all going to be using cryptocurrencies and, and buying NFTs uh, at this point, and I don't hear much discussion about that anymore. Um, but I, I think on the, the work point and around AI, like what I really think about, and it was part of what really kind of um, woke me up to, and, and kind of, I guess, gave me a more critical perspective on the tech industry, was that in the mid-2010s, and I'm sure you had similar narratives around here because they were all over North America, basically there was a lot of advancement being made in AI at the time and in automation, and the narrative was that robots or AI were going to take our jobs, right? Um, Self-driving cars were going to eliminate all the work of truckers, um, you know, nobody was going to drive a taxi anymore, uh, you know, and all these other robots were going to replace care workers and elder care workers and baristas at, uh, you know, restaurants and, and cafes and all this kind of stuff. Like, all these jobs were going to be eliminated in the next few years, and we might need a basic income, like, how are we going to address this because nobody's going to have jobs anymore, everyone's going to be super precarious. And this was like the narrative for a couple of years, and then none of it really happened, right? Um, all these jobs weren't eliminated. But what did happen, and, and what I would argue that kind of narrative made us, or, or kind of distracted us from, was the fact that technology was deployed into the workplace. Um, but 
it was not in the way where it eliminated jobs and got rid of work, but it was in such a way that it took power away from workers and moved it up more to management level, right? So we had the rollout of algorithmic management practices. You know, if you look at kind of the gig economy, for example, a lot of this was about shifting people from kind of employment status into contractor status, um, especially in North America. I'm not sure how that's played out in, in Germany, um, but this has been really successful in ensuring that people who were previously employees are now contractors in North America and many other countries around the world. But then you also had companies rolling out, as I said, algorithmic management systems, like if you look at the Amazon warehouses, for example, where those companies are tracking everything that happens within the center, they set really aggressive production targets so that if you're not scanning enough items, um, then you'll get written up and fired pretty quickly. You know, people feel that they can't go take bathroom breaks because, uh, you know, they have such high targets and if they have to take time to go to the bathroom that it's, again, they risk losing their jobs because of this, right? And so again, you see kind of the power leaving the site of the worker and going up to management again. And another kind of innovation there, if you look at the Amazon side of it, and again, especially in places where Amazon workers are non-union, is what you have is kind of the destruction of a union workforce, um, because warehousing in North America is traditionally a union uh, you know, profession that gets paid quite well. But if you look at Amazon warehouses, they're non-union, they're paid much less, the workers have a lot less power, and that's why Amazon is so aggressive in trying to stop the unionization at those, at those places, right? Because they've basically turned what was a unionized profession that was paid quite well into a kind of baseline profession. You know, it's kind of like the equivalent of slightly above minimum wage job in North America now if you were to work at an Amazon warehouse, and they're doing that with delivery as well, which is, again, traditionally unionized, right? Um, and so I would argue that that is the way that you see technology deployed and, and kind of these companies wield their power in such a way where they, again, have placed pressure on workers. And so now that we've entered this cycle again where we're talking about the impact of AI on work, you know, my mind just flashes back to that moment, right, to that period where I see very similar narratives around what AI is going to mean for jobs and potentially eliminating jobs. But then when I actually look at the technology and I talk to the people who are, you know, critics and actually understand this technology, they say, like, you know, what is kind of being presented in the media, what these people who are heads of these companies are saying really isn't reflective of what the technology actually does. Um, and again, I see you know, massive kind of hype, you know, narratives uh, that we need to fear uh, that AI, you know, is a threat to human civilization and all this kind of stuff, masking the fact that they're going to roll these technologies out in such a way that is going to really affect a lot of workers, in particular, potentially white collar workers. And I think on your final point about kind of the potential kind of cross-class alliance, I would say that what we've seen in particular in the last stage of this was again, kind of, it really affected workers who were, you know, I guess in North America, we can, we'd consider them more like blue collar. I don't know if you use that perfect, that term here. Um, but, you know, workers who are tending to do things with their hands, you know, they're out kind of doing the deliveries, they're, uh, you know, engaged in the gig work, they're working in the warehouses, all this kind of stuff. These people were uh, most affected by these tools and these technologies being rolled out. The potential that we see now, I would say, is for that to roll out more kind of, again, um, more in kind of the professional, the office workers, that sort of a thing, where we've already had technologies rolled out that can sur surveil what people are doing on the, their computers. Um, you know, we saw this a lot when people were working from home, particularly during the early stages of the pandemic, where, you know, there was a lot of new surveillance tools introduced to see what people were doing on their computers because they weren't in the workplace where they could be directly surveilled by a manager. Um, and so those things are rolling out and AI could significantly kind of enhance the capabilities of those types of tools to see what people are actually doing to surveil their work, um, to ensure that managers have more power over them. And we've also seen a push by the tech companies in particular, I'm sure it's happening at other firms, to again, shift people from employees to contractors. One of the things we don't realize about a lot of these tech companies is that a lot of their employees are actually a contract workforce that are paid a lot less than, you know, the tech salaries that we actually recognize and that are often reported on in the media. Um, so yeah, I think there's many stages of that and I would hope that, I think that we're already seeing a bit of this, you know, again, I'm not very 
up on what's happening in Germany in terms of tech organizing, um, but we're already seeing this in North America where you know Google workers, Amazon workers, Uber workers even have been uh, over time organizing and speaking out um, about how technologies are used on you know their contract workforces, on the workforces that are kind of below them, but also you know the kind of threats that they see for themselves, and hopefully you know we would just see that continue. I think. Thank you. Uh, I assume there are some questions in the audience. Um, yes, I see one hand, two hands, and three hands, four hands. Super. So what I would like to do is the Jen uh, speakers list. So don't uh, be confused if you have raised your hand uh, first. Uh, but I will um, switch between um, uh, speakers. Uh, we do have a microphone back there, Judith. Um, uh, we have some special equipment, um, uh, which is a microphone on a stick. <laughs> Uh, she will hold the mic and you can ask the question. I saw the first uh, person raise uh, you know, the hand over there in the orange and then over here. You know, can you raise it again so Judith can see you? She, she will hold the mic. You can just speak. <laughs> If that's possible. Sorry. Okay. This looks a bit weird. Hi. Hi, Paris. Thanks so much. That was really Hi. great. Uh, and I love your podcast. Kind of got me through the pandemic in a lot of ways. So I've really feel connected to it. Um, it's sort of strangely calming as well as being terrifying. Um, but I wanted to, um, I, I guess there's a flip side to this whole Technofix conference in, in my head. And, it, and it's like, well, if the technology doesn't work, and I think you really clearly outlined that it won't, and it probably never will, then, then I'll, the question is, then what? And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in Brussels for the Beyond Growth conference, which was very interesting. And problematic in some ways and I but I think it was a really interesting counterpoint to this whole net zero agenda and I just wondered what you think about degrowth as an overall narrative as an overall agenda and whether it's a meaningful way of challenging kind of net zero and techno fixes thank you and um, we'll collect uh, three questions and then get back to you um, over here <coughs> Thank you. I was just going to make one remark and then one uh, question. The remark is that we actually don't question so much the big money that comes in, the U.S. money for, you know, all the policy field, the policy, the think tanks and stuff. So um, they are even the feature here as environmental organizations, etc. And then you look at, and you, oh, that's the big, um, big tech money financing actually in the U.S. And you, we don't really make that connection yet here. Um, but the other thing that really puzzles me about this, these technologies is that they're basically, I mean, we all realize they're bets. They're, they're so irreal. They're Fata Morgana, we call them. Uh, but it's so hard to discuss, you know, something that's not real, that's being treated as real in the policy space. And even they even already make money with these projected profits. So the profits are real already. Uh, it's really confusing to address, you know, you're fighting a, a Fata Morgana, actually, um, that is real in impact. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, how do we do that? Or <laughs> yeah. Good, good observation. Uh, there was one more question over there. Uh, maybe, yeah, you, did you go around that way. And I saw one more hand over here. Okay, so, but then we go this and this way, but in the next round. So, your question is the last one for this round. Uh, yeah. So thank you for your work. I also find it very inspiring and a very concise presentation. Um, I'd like to bring up sort of like how do we resist this tech oligarchy and its combination of being part of the nation state, the industrialized north uh, countries that are exploiting the south to have the resources to, to make this high tech culture expand infinitely. So, um, I don't know, it's kind of depressing to think about how we can fight all of this, uh, this bombardment of nastiness, but um, it makes me think of uh, the strategies that were being talked about in terms of rebel cities. I think it was David Harvey's book. Um, and we had a really interesting example here in Berlin where uh, communities and neighborhoods rose up to fight Google Campus moving into the neighborhoods. So maybe if you could somehow expand on that, like how we could, you know, rise up as a city to say, hey, we don't want this kind of um, abusive predatory power in our 
in our communities. Uh, there was a great slogan in the in the Google campaign that was, uh, Google is not a good neighbor. Um, simple things like that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much for all those questions. Um, I'll, I'll go one by one and you know, hopefully I'll, I'll get to all the points. Um, D-Girls I, I find really interesting. I find like the term is a bit off-putting, I feel like, you know, for some people in terms of uh, you know, what it kind of suggests, especially because we've been told for so long that growth is kind of associated with progress and things getting better and all this stuff, even as you know, I think the economy has continued to grow for the past few decades, but especially in North America, um, you know, I feel like wages have stagnated, living standards have stagnated as well, and a lot of that kind of benefit has, has gone to the top, right? Uh, we've seen these people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos get fabulously wealthy while you know, other people have, have not kind of experienced that housing cost keep rising, all this kind of stuff. I think that you know, what is kind of suggested by degrowth that we need to consider kind of the economic model that we have, that we need to consider like kind of the, the idea and the notion of like what a good life looks like and what kind of life we're trying to set up, we're trying to achieve, what kind of society that we're trying to create. I think these things are all really important questions and I think questions that people are already asking themselves. Um, like I already, I already see a lot of people who are kind of frustrated with um, the expectation of kind of constant consumption and always having to buy new things and how things like seem to all be getting worse. You know, appliances don't last anymore. I don't know if it's the same in, yeah, absolutely, okay. Yeah, in North America too, you know, they don't last, you can't repair them. Like, you know, it, it's terrible, right? It's like everything keeps getting worse and we're just expected to buy more and more. I see a lot of people really frustrated with that, right? And that's a result of kind of the culture that we have and the system that we have. And I think that there's a lot of kind of you know, I feel like the idea of, of degrowth and challenging the mentality of growth is something that is treated as like, you know, we just can't even imagine something like that. Like, why would we ever, because this is what our society is based on. But I think that when you actually kind of dig into it, like it's not saying that everything needs to kind of, you know, be kind of constrained and reduced. It's like, what are the things in society that don't make any sense and how can we kind of attack those things and kind of you know, reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, re reduce kind of the expectation of endless consumption and all these kinds of things. Um, and then you know, focus on investing more in kind of communal solutions, public spaces, public abundance, like all these kinds of things that we actually care about that actually make people's lives better. Um, and so I think that's really key, right? And I think that a slogan like, like just a term degrowth doesn't get to that and that's why you kind of need to flesh out the broader kind of idea, right? Um, and I think that a lot of people would actually be on board for those kinds of things, right? You know, society used to be a little bit more like that before, you know, neoliberalism and privatization, all these kinds of things. It's, you know, in, in a sense it's returning, but it's also thinking about, um, you know, what's new, what's better, what can we do to improve on the past and the present and all those sorts of things. Um, so hopefully that addresses the question. Um, the question of how we kind of address these technologies that don't even really exist but are treated as though they do, I, I think that that's a big question, right? And, and I think it's quite difficult and I think it comes back to what I was saying about how the tech industry does seem to like exist on these, on, on this kind of cycle of hype, right? Where things don't actually need to exist but they can still make money. Um, and this was kind of the, the, you know, it's kind of like the foundation of the industry. Um, there's a great book by Malcolm Harris called Palo Alto where he goes into the history of, you know, that part of the US but also kind of the political economy of the tech industry and he kind of, you know, his argument is basically that, you know, you have the tech bubble in the 1990s, right? The dot, dot com boom in the late 90s that kind of collapses in 99, 2000. And like the tech industry learned from that, not that you need to avoid this kind of period of rapid growth and collapse, but that that's like a great way to kind of continue building wealth and kind of continuing this thing, right? And so you just constantly see these boom and bust cycles because this is the way that venture capital kind of makes its profit, right? Let's kind of boost everything up, let's make things really explode, then hopefully some of us can cash out and make a lot of money while other people kind of lose their investments, but maybe they'll kind of win next round, right? Um, and so I think it's really, I think the problem that exists in that then is that it really distracts us again, like if we're thinking through the lens of techno fixes, if we're thinking through the lens of what impact these technologies have on our society, it's not just thinking about climate change and, and the discussions that we have about climate technology, but again, a few years ago we were talking about what is our society going to look like when we're all using cryptocurrencies, and now we're talking about what impact is AI going to mean and what is it going to mean for our jobs, and I feel like it distracts from the real conversation because we're talking about what the tech industry 
industry wants us to talk about, or you know, these other industries that are pushing these techno fixes, instead of actually talking about the real issues and the real impacts. And so I think that you know, it's incumbent on, I think, the public to a degree to have kind of the critical skills to engage with these things and to understand it. But I wouldn't just put it solely on the public because that like individualizes the problem, right? I think it's kind of inherent in our, in our governments to be able to push back on these things, to be able to question them more, to be able to think about technologies and regulation and all these sorts of questions. And like instead of just accepting that new technology should exist and should roll out, like to question new technologies when they emerge and to say, does this really make sense? Is this a technology that works for us? Do we want to allow this to happen? And also for the media to be able to kind of look at these technologies because ultimately that's where a lot of the public gets their information and to say, and, and to not be kind of, you know, taken in by the narratives of this tech industry and just to kind of repeat them as we're seeing with a lot of the, the tech stuff today, you know, you. I know Sam Altman is on a European tour, or was just recently, and of course he's talking about how AI is this big existential threat to humanity and stuff, instead of thinking about the real threats that AI present and what it means for people's jobs and what it means for surveillance and what it means for kind of equity and all these other questions, right? Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about these bigger questions, the things that he wants us to focus on. And so it becomes really difficult, and so that's why I think like, you know, we need to be able to look at these technologies and to assess them as a public. I think that's important, and to be able to have these critical conversations with people when they bring these technologies up to us to say, you know, I'm not really sure that, you know, th that is the best way to think about it or that this really makes much sense, but also to expect better from our media and our governments as well. And again, part of the problem there, and this probably starts to touch on your question, is that you know, our governments kind of buy into this kind of neoliberal approach. They don't want to kind of challenge the system as it exists. You know, the one that exists kind of creates a lot of profit is, is kind of driving economic models right now. You know, part of the reason that we didn't regulate the tech industry very much in the early 2010s was because, you know, we were just through a recession. This was going to be what was going to drive economic growth and job creation into the future. So why would we kind of challenge that or why would we kind of think critically about it? We needed to embrace it, right? So Uber can expand and do whatever it wants to do and all these other companies and we're not going to worry about it. Uh, and of course now we're trying to deal with that. And then the other piece of it, of course, is the media, you know, has, has had its funding affected by the growth of these tech companies, uh, you know, doesn't get as much advertising revenue as it used to in the past, hasn't figured out how to address the, kind of the, the crunch in revenue to actually invest in the reporting and the investigative reporting and all that kind of stuff that's necessary to hold these, these companies and, and to hold these companies to account, but also to question these technologies. And so, yeah, I think that there's a kind of a serious problem there, and certainly it works in favor of the companies that are pushing all these techno fixes on us. Um, but that means it's incumbent on us to try to challenge that. And so I think that starts to get to your question around, you know, how we kind of push back against, um, you know, these companies and their kind of ideas for how we should change our cities or, you know, societies more broadly, I guess. You know, I, I am aware of the pushback on, on Google that happened here in Berlin. I think it's fantastic. And, you know, I think it happened in a moment where there was kind of a broader pushback that was happening in cities around the world on tech companies, which was really kind of inspiring and hopeful. We saw Stockholm and Melbourne um, ensure that Apple couldn't build stores in their public spaces, their public squares, um, got those projects shut down. We saw um, in New York City, people campaigned against uh, an Amazon headquarters that was supposed to be built there and that was promised $3 billion in subsidies and got that canceled. Um, we saw in Toronto, Google was gonna build a smart city um, in Toronto and people there organized as well and got that project shut down and Google eventually pulled out and you know is, is not kind of doing that anymore. And so I think that you know, what we see and, and what kind of, um, what I see in those various examples is that people can be very effective in pushing back against these tech companies. Um, you know, when we, I think, just look at them as services that aren't kind of interfering in physical space and are just kind of online, it's more abstract, right, the, the impact that they're actually having on society. But when you start to see the physical footprint and kind of the attempt to alter physical space, then I think it becomes much clearer what their goals are and what they're trying to do, right? You can see it in a much more tangible way than if you're just logging onto google.com or, or something like that, right? Um, and I think that what we see is that this organizing can be very effective um, and that ultimately, if we're thinking about how we push back on these companies, you know, uh, I'm not gonna say I have all the answers or I know the best way to do it or, or anything like that, you know, I'm not an organizer. But um, 
what it appears to me and what seems very clear to me is that the only way that you're gonna challenge the power of these very wealthy and influential individuals and companies is again by being kind of organized in a way that is going to counter them, whether that is through unions, through community organizations, through movements, like whatever, it's going to be the pushback against them, but ultimately it's that collective power that you need to push back against, you know, kind of the, the concentrated and centralized power of these large, very influential companies. So I hope that answers your question. You should really visit Warschauer Straße and the new Amazon Tower. I think it's uh, the synonym of evil buildings, <laughs> uh, especially as it was built in winter and it was uh, all cloudy and you could see it from afar and it looked just like Darth Vader's headquarter <laughs> landed, uh, landed down there. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. I know there are some questions left in the audience, but Paris, you will be with us throughout the day. Absolutely. Um, which is uh, very exciting, and you will probably uh, be able to join some of the workshops. Super, so it worked out that we um, managed to, uh, to get to English ones. Um, please feel free to, to ask Paris uh, all the questions you have throughout the day. Um, take advantage of this uh, great brain we have with us. Um, and for now, thank you very much. It thank was you. very, very interesting. Um, <laughs> yes. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs>